Dirk, I've been using the interval while I've been getting ready to look around your house. And it's a, it is a beautiful house, luxurious house, exquisitely furnished. Uh, I see the works of Tacitus over there in Latin. Uh, do you read Latin? No, I bought them to fill in the bookcase. I see. Yes. <laughs> Would you say that? Uh, this is so. What worries me? This is terribly different. This house and its well-ordered luxury uh, from the uh, public image of the haunted, hunted, passionate young characters you so often play in your films. Is the public image very different from the private Dirk Bogart? Your version of the public image is very different, Daniel. Yes. Uh, I didn't know I was haunted and <laughs> hunted or whatever you call it. You were at the beginning of your career. Oh yes, the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, I never really did let that one down, I don't think, for a no. long time. And you know the, the British press loved to tag you with things. They invent tags. They invented yeah. hunted for me. Yeah. And they invented the angry young man. And I think they even invented Bridget Barnett, frankly, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, you want to get on to, to, to asking me questions about the films. Well, this luxurious house, as you said, yeah. I suppose it is luxurious in a way. You haven't stayed the night here and you haven't eaten here, but it's pretty good generally. Isn't it? Yes, I look This cool. is the relics or the results of... Uh, 35 films, I believe. I suppose it's about that. Anyway, 14 years um, solid work. Yes. At least I've got something to show for it, because the pictures aren't, haven't been all that too hot, you know. No. Some of them. No, no, not the ones on the walls, the ones you made. You mean. Uh, the ones I made. The ones yeah. on the walls are the best collection of bogus paintings in England, but still, that doesn't matter either. <laughs> but um, out of those 35, I suppose, I suppose I've really enjoyed making about, this sounds awfully stupid, but I've enjoyed making, oh, six out of all of them. Yeah, this is a good point. Let's take what you think are the six landmarks in your film career up to date. Or uh, five. So. Landmarks as opposed to pictures I've thoroughly enjoyed. Yes, yeah. yes. I would have said as landmarks that probably one of the early pictures I made, which was called Hunted, in which I played a little boy called John Whiteley, yeah. which was dismissed in this country as a sort of another, you know, on the run picture, because I'd made too many on the run. This was your, really your first starring part. It was the first time I'd had my name about the title to carry a picture on its own. Yeah. I'd say Hunted, certainly. Uh, then I'd say, without any doubt, Doctor in the House. Yes. This was a complete landmark. It broke a long run of neurotic pathological killers and boys in Macintoshes. Yes. After that, I'd say, um, without doubt, The Doctor's Dilemma, which was the Shaw play, yeah. because that at last gave me a chance to, to act on the screen. I suppose the next landmark would be the first time I went to Hollywood and did the film Song Without End, which was yeah. the, uh, uh, the story of Franz Liszt. Yeah, that was a landmark because I worked for the first time ever with a top key, brilliant American director, yeah. George Cukor, who taught me more in six months than I'd learnt in 14 years before, or yes. 12 years before. Well, we're we just uh, reeling these off now. Well, What's the next four. one? Well, I suppose this present film, which is shortly going to come out in London, uh, which is called Victim. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. Mm. Let's go back to Hunted. Because I remember you vividly in the years 1947 to 50, playing a young thug. Yeah, in I started film. running about 47. I don't think I stopped till about 53, which mm. is when Hunted came out. Yes. And... Um, Hunted, I think, was one of the best of the bunch. I did an awful lot of rubbish at that time. I seemed to wear a Macintosh all, all the way through and be chased over bomb sites. They were sort of fashionable. That was with that little boy. John Whiteley. Get back! You can't come now! Get back!
right now. I won't leave you again, I promise you. Gosh, you get me a fright. You can't keep yourself out of trouble for a minute, can you? Left my wood gloves behind. That's a terrible thing to do. We'll have to get you another one somewhere else, shall we? How did you start uh, uh, this trend as a young thug in a trench coat? Well, you must remember at that time, in 1947, when yeah. I started, um, it was very fashionable to have bomb sites, because there were plenty of them. Yeah. Uh, spivs were tremendously important, long before they thought of teddy boys. And it, it was kind of fashionable. Mm -hmm. Films of violence were an immediate reaction from the war, yeah. you know. You were an actor in search of a bomb site. So we were an actor, I was an actor in search of a bomb site, or as one critic said, an actor in search of God. I don't know what that quite meant, but it stuck for an awful long time. <laughs> and they gave me... Are you a religious person? No, no. Well, I'm no more religious than the no ordinary sense, average but, man. Yes. Yeah. But uh, in this case, they gave me a Macintosh in one picture, and it seemed that I wore the same prop for about four or five. Yes. But you never were a, a, a biceps boy, were you? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Yeah. There was a wonderful time when the rank organization decided that I should be, yeah. that my head was too small, my legs were too long, and I was too skinny. Yeah. So they went to great expense and got um, these, you know, weight yeah. bars, which I couldn't move. Uh, we got the thing sent down, they came off a truck and they lay where they were for about six years. Yes. And I used to put two pullovers on and fool them that way. Yes, Hunted was your first starring part, but it was the Doctor series that brought you to the really big public, wasn't it? National, and if you like to put it that way, international, right. because the Doctor's played in every country in the world, which is unusual for a British film anyway. And the, the Doctor, at least Doctor in the House, yes. uh, was the, um, well, it was the crossroads picture, because up until then I was sort of, really marking time a bit, you know, and if you mark time on one spot, you know, what happens, you go into a hole mm. and you can't get out. Uh, Betty Box and Rafe Thomas had this brilliant idea, I thought, anyway, uh, to put me in it. There was a great deal of opposition because, as you said, I'd been playing these uh, Cockneys and Spivs. And, and this was a comic part, and of course you're not a comedian. It was a comic film. It was a funny film. I'm not a comedian, no. Uh, the point about the Doctor in Doctor, and all the Doctor films was that uh, Simon Sparrow was never funny. Now, I remember that very funny scene when you were examining your first patient. And who are you? We're the students, sister. Oh, are you? Well, I do not like students. However, I'm forced to put up with you. But I warn you, I stand no nonsense in my ward. Is that clear? As crystal, sister. Hmm. You will examine patients 5, 12, 18, and 20. You will replace the bedclothes neatly. You will not walk upon any part of the floor that has recently been polished. And you will not talk to the nurses on any except strictly professional matters. Is that understood? Yes. Very well. You may proceed. Proceed? Proceed where? Choose a number and examine it, I suppose. Hey, there's a new lot of students coming. We can have a bit of fun. I don't feel like fun. Oh, cheer up, Alfie. You're not dead yet. You soon will be if you let those students get at you. Do you think they'll know we've never examined a patient before? Oh, don't be silly. They think we're doctors. I can hear the sea. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, would you mind if I examined you? All yours, Doctor. Oh, dear. Uh, <coughs> well. <coughs> He's 76. I just took it myself. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would you excuse me just a minute? Page is subacute appendicitis. I have no idea. I'm looking for the chest. What are you doing with your bedclothes pushed back, Mr. Briggs? I'm being examined, nurse. Are you? By whom? Uh, good afternoon, nurse. Good afternoon. Now, I'd just like to examine your chest. Yeah. 
It's my stomach that's wrong, Doctor. <laughs> yes, of course it is. Uh, what are your symptoms? I have hydronephrosis, nephrolithiasis, and attacks of renal colic. Thank you very much. He has hammer toes, too. <clears throat> you were a very serious, sympathetic young doctor, weren't you? Yes, he had to be, you know, because you had to have a basis of truth in that story, because nothing... He didn't do anything particularly funny. The no. funny things happened to him. Yeah. It was tremendously rewarding and and, uh, and changed the whole entire course of my career from that very day. Although um, I've heard recently that Hunted is showing in the arts uh, theatres in New York. Yes, it, it still runs in America. There, so mm. That's funny, yes. Um, so you did three Doctor pictures in a row? Not in a row. Not no. in a row, no. Uh, there was a two-year gap between each one. But I did in a row, which was very marvellous for me, I did seven pictures in a row with uh, Ray Thomas and Betty Box. Now, they had carefully worked out a plan for me, with myself in mind, that between the, the, the three doctors that we were to do, we'd do sort of light romantic parts. We did Toad Two Seasons Isn't and all this. Yes. Uh, yes, things like uh, Spanish Garden, uh, Campbell's Kingdom, where you were in the rocket. That's right. We, we tried a bit of everything, yeah, so that every range came in, yeah. which was a tremendous experience. Isn't this an awful lot, three or four pictures in a year? Uh, Money-wise, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time, I believe, when my father called me up and said, you're in Brighton in 17 cinemas or something. That is too much. You appeared in plays until just about two years ago, didn't you? Yes, I always tried to do that. Yeah. The organization used to let me out for a play every two years or every three years when it was possible to do so. Why did you give that up? I gave it up, really, because I did too much filming, and the strain of doing a play, I found after three years filming, was, was enormous. And I always chose, for some reason, best known to myself, Jolly difficult parts to play in very gloomy plays, yeah. <laughs> and it was double strain. You know, yeah. and it was too it was too much to do. So you're finished with the stage now, for the time being, yes. yes. Um, talking about the Doctor, oh, four or five years after the Doctor in the House series, you made another Doctor picture, Doctor's Dilemma, that based on the Bernard Shaw play. Yes, that was very different. That was quite a different thing, and that I think was the film uh, of all that I really, I really bust to do. I was longing to do that. Uh, everybody advised me not to. They said it would be a box office flop and poison and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened, of course, was what we rather envisaged would happen was that the moment the film came out, people flocked to see it because they thought it was another doctor in the series, you see. Mm -hmm. And a great many seats went clacking backwards after about a quarter of an hour of that little number because they all went back and asked for their money. <laughs> it, yes. But, um, you know, it was not a comedy, but it was the most rewarding film I've ever done from yes. every point of view, critically and from... from uh, at last, I said to you just now that I'd yeah. never had an acting part. That was one I did have. Yes, there's the, the death scene in that. I think that's one of the best scenes you've ever made. The fans, the fan following you'd built up mm. up to that time, did, they didn't like this oh, picture, no. did they? No, they didn't like it. Yeah. You've got to remember there is a gr group, I mean, there are followers, there are fans and fanatics. Yeah. Uh, the fanatics didn't like it at all. Uh, the fans weren't too keen on it, but out of loyalty came. The followers still came. You always have followers, you see. And that's the, the hard core of your audience, if you're a film actor or a film star, if you like to use that phrase, that stay with you whatever you do. Yeah. But the fans are a little different. They vary. And the fanatics uh, only stick with you, um, like the barnacles, you know, for so long. Of course, playing an artist was obviously not new to you. You were trained as an artist originally, didn't you? Yes, but I'm not that amoral. I mean, this is... <laughs> there are artists and artists. I know. <laughs> Mr. Dubedat. You're not very bohemian either, are you? This house is so... It's, it's, it's so tidy and well organized. Well, bohemian's a very odd English word. What does it mean? Usually it means that you sit on the floor and, and eat baked beans out of a... out of a cardboard It just box. means you're careless in your ways, I think. Oh, and, yes, well, I'm fairly um, careless in my ways. I, I have a very good staff who look after me and make sure that I'm not too careless. I suppose that's yeah. what it means. This place means a lot to you, doesn't it? It's very much lived in, this house. Well, my home means everything to me, really, right? which is rather a nuisance, because uh, I've always had roots, I've always wanted to have roots, and I think it's essential in this job, particularly, that you don't spend all your life in hotel bedrooms or living temporarily. Uh, as now, we do so much location work, and I'm sort of the king of location, or what? Um, it's important to have somewhere behind you that you know is your home and is running and is geared for you when you come back to it. Do you find that your friends are in the film world, or do you have friends outside that? Um, yeah. Certainly, I'd say it, yes. I, um, I haven't got a great many friends. I, uh, one has a lot of acquaintances, yes, naturally. Right. But most of my chums are in the business because, uh, well, we all talk about the same thing. But a lot of people are outside it, which is much more pleasurable. Just one other point I'd like to make about Dr. Dilemma. This was directed by Anthony Asquith. Yes. Really the first big-name director you had worked with. Do you like a strong director? 
I think it's absolutely essential for me to have a strong director. I can't work without a director. And I know, I know the results the moment I see the picture. But you have a strong personality yourself. Do you find you argue about how scenes should be done? Uh, yes, I try to. Um, but you know, you Who wins when you argue? Oh dear Lord, that depends very much on the director. Very often it's an unhappy compromise. Yes. Um, usually if the director is the sort of director he should be, he wins, which is his job to win. Yes. You know. Soon after this you went to Hollywood, although they've been trying to get you ever since 1954 when you were offered a part in a biblical epic, I think, <laughs> called the Egyptian. The Egyptian, yes. Yeah. Uh, were you happy in Hollywood? Yes, I was very happy in Hollywood. I, I absolutely loved it. It was the most exciting uh, six months work. It was murder to do. And uh, as such, the film, to me, was a disappointment. This film, of course, was the life of Liszt's song without end. Yes. Uh, and opposite you was starring Capucine, the French actress. That's right. How did you feel about that part? It was a big, lavish spectacular with a full treatment. Well, I felt simply when I got the script, uh, I was very ill at the time with pneumonia and was on my way out. And uh, they thought it might be a good idea, the doctors, for me to read the script to sort of try and revive an interest, you know. And I realized, even at that very low state, that this was a part that I'd never be offered in this country because mm. it had everything in it. It was, uh, it, it was the most enormous cell styling role, yes. which was possibly its mistake, I don't know. Um, but also, as you said, it was, the, it was the full musical lavish. It cost something like three and a half million dollars. Yeah. It took six months to make. And it was the most marvelous introduction to Hollywood because I didn't terribly want to go. So I went on my terms, which was excellent, and um, worked with, as it turned out, George Cukor, who's one of the greatest directors in Hollywood, who took over the film when Charles Beadle unfortunately died after three weeks shooting. And that was the most enormous experience I think I'd ever had. I remember a lot of publicity surrounded that film. There was, of course, the publicity surrounding you and the star, Capucine, but I don't want to talk about that. How do you feel generally about publicity? I suppose, as a film star, open and close quotes, you uh, lap it up, do you? Uh, no, I obviously lap it up. Well, um, publicity... I should thought, I mean, a film star is distinct from an actor who lives on publicity. Oh, film star, awful press. I, anyway, um, I can't argue that. I'm sorry, I mean, you're labelled with this. Uh, yes, I know. You it's are the only star ever, ever since Jean Harlow, I think, yeah. Clara Bow. So we're all tied with the same brush. Yeah. Uh, publicity, of course, is essential. You, if you make a picture, it costs a great deal of money. Um, you've got to have it known that it's on the floor because somebody's got to go and see it. I think publicity is all right as long as it doesn't intrude on your private life. I think that's nothing to do with the public at all whatsoever. Difficult to draw the borderline in some cases. Well, if you, if, you, if you keep your publicity to do with your film and your performance and the things that happen on and around the floor, that's enough. Are you that's going back to Hollywood? If they ask me, certainly, I wouldn't hesitate. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the right, you know, the right thing. You've nothing against Hollywood as such. Oh, heavens no. It's the most wonderful place in the world to do your work. Really? I think it's the only place to do your work. Yes. This is not the view of every English actor. Well, you, you know, Hollywood is, is you either accept it, mm -hmm. or you don't accept it, or it doesn't accept you. There are three mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. I accepted it, unfortunately they accepted me. I loved it there. It's, it's a bit like Golders Green in New Delhi, or yeah. Olden. So White. many people are fleeing from Hollywood, you would like to go back. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think people are fleeing from it, are they? Mm -hmm. Oh, perhaps they are, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, well, well, the trend is, you know, they tend to, 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 to move out. I think you would flee living. from living there. Any, yes. any sensible person would flee yes. like hell from yeah. there. But you, uh, you couldn't do better than to work there. I'd like to move on now to your latest film, Victim. Uh, this is basically a blackmail story, a detective story, and on that level alone, let it be said, it's a very exciting, suspenseful picture. But what gives it its peculiar bite and depth is the fact that it's concerned with homosexuals. Yes. Um, it was your picture. How would you briefly describe your part? It's difficult to describe it briefly, but briefly in a sort of uh, capsule. Yeah. It's the story, as you know yourself, as you saw it yeah. the other day, of a, a barrister who's happy to marry, but who is finally blackmailed and destroyed by a previous relationship with a man which could or could not have been uh, a homosexual one. Yes. You must feel very strongly in this subject to risk losing possibly a large part of your, of your following by appearing in such a bitterly controversial film. I don't think so, no. Mm. Um, uh, th you see, I told you a little while ago that uh, the, the parts were not always so good. Yeah. Uh, this is a marvellous part, and in the film I think that it's tremendously important because it doesn't pull any punches. It's quite honest. Mm -hmm. It isn't, I don't have to use any old tricks for the fans. It's a straightforward character performance, which is what I've been You're made to look much older than you are in the picture. I play my own age, yeah. which is 40, but I, I have to look <laughs> rather older than that because 
I, you know, you I don't look young. forty. Let it be said. No, let it be said. But uh, I don't think that uh, this. Is, everybody said, "Oh, why did you make such a controversial picture?" This is ridiculous. Um, actors are here for that. Yes. Uh, you get stuck with uh, rows of boring pictures that people go to see forever. People will go and see this film, I'm quite sure, and thoroughly enjoy it, or be distressed by it, or, but they will be moved somehow by it. Mel? The boy in the paper. Barrett. The one that hanged himself in Fulham Police Station. Is that the same boy that phoned here? Yes. Yes, it is. You were there yesterday. Did the police send for you? Yes. Why? Apparently they found a book. He kept uh, a scrapbook. Press cuttings about me. Pictures. Why? Hero worship. Who was this boy, Barrett? I gave him a lift occasionally. You never told me? No. Papers say he was a wages clerk. Been stealing from his firm. How did you come to meet a boy like that? Back in the spring. After a late session, the and the last buses are gone. You stopped seeing him and he killed himself. Mr. Parr? What do you want? I want to talk to you. I only see people by appointment. I think you ought to see this photograph. That's what boys pay to keep quiet. You and him. I just found it. You'd better come upstairs. Morning, Mr. Farr. Morning, William. If there are any calls, you take them. I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, sir. We're in court this morning. Yes, sir. There we are. It's clear enough now. Boys stole all that money to pay for the negative. But the bastard's never sent it. Just another print as a reminder. How, uh... How could they have taken this? They were obviously trailing boy. Telephoto lens. It's an old dodge. You were in the car. You would never see them. You've shown this to the police. Well, of course I haven't. But that's what he was trying to prevent. Don't you see? Yes, I see. Why did he have to go and hang himself? He knew the police would get it out of him in the end. He didn't want to involve you. And you'll be all right. Yes. He should have come to you. He wasn't big enough to be on his own like that. He should have come to you. He did. I thought he was trying to blackmail me. I wouldn't even talk to him. Jeez. Poor old boy. He didn't stand much of a chance between you and the blackie, did he? No. This is directed, would you say, to a different audience to the one you've been this appealing to hitherto. This is directed to this new and very exciting audience, which has come up, if I may say so, yes. since you came, you know, since television started. Yes. Because the younger people of today, that means, you know, the, the teenagers that are lumped together as lunatics and louts, they're not. There is a lunatic fringe, there always is. But the average teenager now is much more inquiring than I was at 18 or 19 or 16. They're asking many more questions. There is a new audience coming back to the cinema. This is terribly exciting. Everything has shown us in the last two years that gradually the cinema tendencies are coming up again all over the world, not just in, in Great Britain, but they are going to a different kind of picture now. There's always a place for, for the carry-ons and all those, you know, like comedies. Yeah. There always will be, thank heaven. Yeah. But now people go for more adult entertainment. I mean, look at the...
types of films that have been shown recently, like Sunday last summer, Saturday night, Sunday morning, uh, Long the Short and the Tall, pictures that wouldn't have been made five years ago. And Victim, I mean, you couldn't have made Victim, I think, two years ago. Are you worried about the future? No, good heavens, it's the most exciting future possible. I've been 14 years under contract to the Rank Organization, which was a splendid, marvelous 14 years. I learned tremendous amounts from it. But now I'm free of them, uh, and they very kindly let me go. Yeah. And I can go now and do what I want to do. They always thought I was a lunatic anyway, to do the things that I want to do. Now, Doctor's Dilemma was one. Yes. Uh, victim is another. Um, I'm shortly going to make a film with Sir Alec Guinness, in which there's not one redeeming feature in the character whatsoever. He doesn't even look very nice. Yeah. Is but I know that this film is the right film for an audience that is happening today. Yes. Your career has showed a certain pattern in that you've done uh, a certain sequence of pictures of a type and then you've broken away completely. Mm. You broke away from the hunter type into comedy, yes. then into Doctor's Dilemma, yes. entirely different. Yes. Yes. And now you're a victim. But what sort of picture can you make in the future? Well, I've got a book of my own, which, uh, not my own, a book which I bought called Covenant yes. of Death, which is about the Battle of the River Somme which I hope very much that I'm going to be able to produce myself next year, in, in the summer. Now, I don't want to be in it particularly, because it's a story essentially about very young men, because they were very young men who were killed in the song. But I, I would like to be in it and play a character part in it, just for the, for the hell of it, to be yes. in my own production. But basically, I want to put it on the screen, yes. not necessarily be in it. But I, I want to choose any part I like that excites me, however big it is, wherever the billing is, whatever it looks like. So it's worth playing. Worth playing. Mm. You don't worry so much whether it's right for you. This used to be the... It'll be right for me if it's worth playing. And you will have complete control over the roles you play? As far as I'm able to, I hope yes. it is. I can go wrong there. <laughs> Actors do come unstuck when they're on their own. Very but you're completely confident that you, you will choose the right kind of picture for yourself? Yes, I'm This sure is difficult, I admittedly. No, I, it isn't difficult, no. because I, in the past, we've seen four or five clips of things. Now, yes. all those pictures I chose to do myself. A number of pictures I didn't choose to do myself, had to do. Yes. They didn't always succeed. But the ones I picked specifically to play in, I haven't really come unstuck on. Well, I think it's a very honest approach. <laughs> it's kind of dried you up, didn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, uh, you know, it sounds as if I was too confident. Yes. But uh, out of 36 pictures, I know the ones that did me most good. Yes. Uh, even if they weren't box office good. No, you have been wrong commercially on several occasions. Well, very often, because the best things aren't necessarily commercial. Unfortunately. When you're financing yourself, of course, to be long, wrong commercially, this, this, this could be a bad thing. A draft up your kilt at any time is uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to take that risk? Yes. And if you're satisfying, uh, can I use the word soul, if you're satisfying yes. your own soul, you've got to take the risk with it. Yes. And obviously I have to go back one day and, and make a commercial picture. This is a very good thing to do. Yes. In between the, the ones you want to make for yourself. Well, at this stage, obviously the biggest crossroads in your career so far now that you're on your financial own, at last, I sincerely trust the wind will be tempered to the shore now. Thank you very much. Come on. Come in. Oi, oi. This is the mast of it. At loose, loose. This is the mast of Dare it. Dare I touch him? Oh, be fair. Oh, I touch him. Oh, lovely. She's a kind of drippy. <laughs> a drippy girl. <laughs>